Thank you for taking the time to attend this presentation. The logo up in the corner there is from the last time I made a presentation to the Inkosi Ch Chesapeake chapter. I'll start with some apologies and a warning. This talk perceives traditional systems engineering in a different way. It's based on a different paradigm. It's not the Inkosi paradigm but it's worked for me 100% of the time on simple and complex projects. The perceptions may challenge you. The perceptions may offend you. If they challenge you, good. If they offend you, I apologize. But the talk is designed to make you think. It's to take you out of your comfort zone. Some of the information may be dated because I've been doing this research for 20 years or so and I've just pulled in slides from earlier presentations. It's all about systems thinking, so let's take a look at problem solving from the systems thinkers perspective. Systems thinkers say when you have a problem, conventional thinking isolates the parts to understand the behavior but that's not what you should do. What you should do is explore the emergent nature of the system as a whole and understand how it works together with its adjacent systems so you can deal with the problem at that level. Okay, fine. It's a cold morning in the winter. The car doesn't start. How does understanding the emergent nature of the car as a whole and its interactions with the other cars that, and the traffic and the traffic light and how you use the car help you with the problem of dealing with the car not starting. You have to use conventional thinking. You have to understand that the cause might be a dead battery because you've got that from conventional thinking. And then conventional thinking and systems thinking doesn't really help you understand where the solution comes from. People tell you to think out of the box for the solution but they don't actually tell you how to do it. To cut a long story short, years and years and years and years of research took place. I had to move from Australia to England and then to Singapore to finalize the research and I came up with something I call the holistic thinking perspectives based on two things. The first thing was all the perceptions of systems engineering and systems thinking I was seeing or partial perceptions of a whole in a similar way to the parable of the blind man feeling the elephant. They all felt a different part of the elephant and they all thought they came up with a different animal. Let's say system thinking and then later on systems engineering is the elephant and what I did was I looked at the the different perceptions in the literature and actually created the elephant, the one that nobody talks about. Or actually it's the two that nobody talk about because there are as many different versions of systems thinking as there are of systems engineering. So at Cranfield University, leveraging on the work of Barry Richmond's Seven Streams of System Thinking, we came up with a number of systems thinking perspectives that were presented at INCOSI in Holland in 2008 and were later renamed the Holistic Thinking Perspectives. And there were nine of them. So there's the big picture perspective and the operational perspective, which broadly translates into systems thinking. There's the functional and structural perspective that translate into conventional thinking. And then we went beyond that. We looked outwards into generic continuum and temporal. Generic is the similarity between this system and other systems. The concept is used in software where objects inherit. So your system can inherit characteristics from the generic type of system. The continuum perspective deals with differences between this system and other systems or differences between the parts of the system. The temporal perspective deals with behavior over time. And then there are two other perspectives, the quantitative perspective, that's where all the numbers come from. And right away I can look at this and say, you know, a requirement consists of functions and numbers. So a requirement needs to be looked at from two different perspectives. 
the scientific perspective, which is the outcome of the thinking process. So the first eight perspectives are what our systems engineer Sherlock here observes and after doing a little bit of critical thinking out comes the scientific perspective which are his inferences and I group them this way external is systems thinking internal is analysis progressive and remaining and I'm going to explain these in a moment and then I'm going to use them to look at or perceive that elephant called systems engineering but first, which perspective is needed? Now remember the car wouldn't start. So if the car wouldn't start, I actually need an internal perspective. But if I want to use the car to do something, to go somewhere, then I need the external perspectives. The internal and external perspectives are useful for understanding the situation. Now, not every perspective is applicable in every instance, but where do the solutions come from? They come from the progressive and remaining perspectives. And I'm going to show you that when I comment on systems engineering and, and then show you some of my conclusions. Consider a camera. From the big picture perspective, we look at where cameras are used and for what purpose, operational, that's what we're doing, capturing images, transporting it, viewing images, adjusting it, charging the battery. Functional are capturing images, the actual details of how the image is captured, storing them, retrieving them, deleting them, how the battery charging functions work. It's the how part of it. Structural perspective, we're looking at the body of the camera, the case of the camera, and the physical aspects of the charger. Generic perspective, other ways of capturing images such as painting, sketching, and so on. Continuum perspective might, might deal with different types and models of camera and different materials used to construct the camera. And the temporal perspective would be the evolution of the image capturing media. It started off commercially with photographic plates, then it went to film, different sizes of film. We're now into solid state memory and Somewhere, in, somewhere and sometime in the future there will be a new technology for storing images. The quantitative perspective deals with number of pixels per inch, the characteristics of the lens, the price of the camera and the memory sticks and so on. And the scientific perspective will depend on the problem or the issue as we look at the, as we perceive the camera from different perspectives and I'll show that here. When I think about a camera and I want to understand how a camera works I use the functional and structural perspectives that's conventional thinking and I think about the system as the camera and it's a closed system. On the other hand when I want to think about capturing images that's an operational perspective then I think about the camera and the operator and whatever I'm taking a picture of and that's also a closed system because I abstract out everything else. If I'm transporting the camera, then I'm thinking about the camera, the operator, and the camera case. Again, everything else is abstracted out. If I'm recharging the camera, then my system contains the camera, the operator, and the charger as a closed system. Not your conventional way of thinking in most cases. Going for unconventional ways of thinking, let's take a look at systems engineering from different perspectives. From the big picture perspective, we see all sorts of things, and I'm not going to go into every single one of them because I've only got 45 minutes. So there are things like the principle of hierarchy, systems engineering education, which is something I've been very concerned with over the last few years systems thinking, sort of context for systems in different domains. There are different views and opinions on systems engineering. It's performed in projects and there are processes, products and problems. Systems engineering overlaps with other disciplines. There's a major focus on process in INCOSI and DOD. And now there's this new fad called model-based systems engineering. Some of you will have seen this. This was presented to General McChrystal in a briefing in 2011 or so 
and his comment was, when we understand that slide, we'll have won the war. This slide totally ignores one of the basic principles of systems thinking and beyond, or, or systems engineering, actually. It's the way we have managed complexity like this over the centuries. And let me give you an example. Abstract out the information and just look at what's there. You'd see something like this. So where is the system or subsystems? Well, I've colored them in in parts, corresponding more or less to the colors in the original chart. How do we deal with this? Well, we break it up. We call it six systems. And we hide everything that's inside each of those systems. So this conforms to Miller's rule. Plus seven plus or minus objects that the human brain can only think about at any one time. If I want to look at the behavior of part of it, I abstract out the parts that I'm not interested in. If I want to look at what's going on inside the system, I abstract out everything except what's going on inside the system, or inside this system, or inside this system, or inside this system, and I realize, whoa, that was a poor choice of partitioning because those two lower objects are not coupled to the three higher objects. Or this one, the square is not coupled in any way to the other two objects. I need to change my system partitioning, or this one. So by just looking at it this way, I've reduced the complexity of the system, and I've also seen that I need to change my architecture. Do you realize it's all fractal? If I take a look at this thing here, and I put a boundary around it, and I fill that boundary in, and then I zoom out like this, it's surrounded by other systems going on. And so the principle of hierarchy says you deal with the level that you need, up one and down one. That's not my principle. It's been stated many times over the years. And that leads to the system optimization paradox. We're taught in class that you don't optimize a subsystem independently, you optimize the system as a whole. Oh, great. Because every system is a subsystem of some larger system. So how do you optimize the system? I'll leave that question with you. I know how I do it. If I go back to looking at systems engineering education, back in 1999 to 2006, and I'm not sure it's changed very much either from what I see. We focus on what's easy to teach. We teach parts. Different universities teach different parts. I found that out 10 years later, as I'll explain in a moment. We show relationships. We don't go into details. We do a lot of teaching of the what, but not the how. And we don't teach the basic building blocks of solutions. And yes, there are gaps there, and we ignore them. I keep finding myself telling students, and you won't find that in the book because I was teaching something that was in one of those gaps. And when I was living in Singapore, I had a contract with CRC Press to write a book on systems engineering based on what I was teaching. OK, fine. I ended up saying I couldn't do it because when I started writing the book and, and filling in those gaps, it filled four books. So I ended up writing four books. We teach things that are not representative of reality. We ignore the paradigm of change. We talk about get all the requirements up front. But wait a minute, the requirements are going to evolve. We don't teach how to manage that. We also don't use the optimal pedagogy or technology. That's changing now. Most of the courses I've seen were all lecture-based, well into the time of problem-based learning and learning by activities. And we mostly teach process or doing it by numbers. And systems thinking isn't taught very well. There was a talk at the Chesapeake chapter last month about the benefits of systems thinking. Well, I was able to do that 20 years ago. I could teach the need for systems thinking, the history, and then I had to tell people, when you're doing it, you'll know it. And I didn't think that was very satisfactory, so I ended up moving to the UK to work out how to do it. We know about system dynamics. We know about Checkland's soft systems methodology and then causal loops, which were publicized in the fifth discipline by Peter Senge. Linear thinking is bad, is it? And then there are vendors and traders out there that will tell you, my approach will solve all your problems. 
when I was in the UK, I attended an INCOSI UK symposium and somebody was telling us in the keynote, I think it was a keynote presentation, but I'm not sure, on Checkland's SSM and how it would solve all systems engineering problems. That's Maslow's hammer syndrome. We don't teach when, where, and how to apply systems thinking systemically and systematically. That's probably why there's so little of it about. And basic influencing literature is generally coming from operations research, not systems engineering community. When we're teaching systems engineering, when we taught the systems engineering process, we used the egg diagram. And I've seen this in various other places. How many people really understand that? We can go through all the words. This is a what. How do you actually do that? You've got requirements, you've got functional analysis, you've got synthesis. How does this relate to the different states or phases in the system development process? This is the way we taught it in 2006. Would you care to explain that? And what was the result? Let's try a different way. Let's teach it as a problem-solving process based on Derek Hitchens. So we've got milestones when we look at it this way. And this is where we can look at it from a whole top view. It maps very nicely into the waterfall. We can show it over the life cycle like so. And it links very nicely into the what's and how's of systems engineering. A what is the problem input to the state. A how is the solution produced by the state. And that creates the what for the subsequent state. So for example, the problem early states is to create the requirements, for example. Once we have the solution, which is a set of requirements, that becomes the problem to the design state. Because now they have to design a system based on those requirements. They output designs, and that becomes the problem to the construction people. And so I would much rather demonstrate the systems engineering process this way than in the egg diagram, because this really shows it's an iterative process, which was Howard Eisner's definition of systems engineering back in 1988. Another look at the system development process from the University of South Australia was we started off with a stack of stakeholder requirements. We had a systems requirements and something happened and then the system was in being. What did we say happened? This was some discussions on systems engineering between Jenny Clothier and Stephen Cook back when I was at UniSA. I'm not surprised when I see that. Look at the books in systems engineering including mine up there. You've got all these books. And they're all different. There's some commonality like requirements and architectures and testing, but otherwise they're all different. So if systems engineers can't agree on what systems engineering is, how could we expect to sell it to organizations to allow us to bring it in there to improve them? And by the way, Howard Eisner's latest book, What Makes the Systems Engineer Successful? I've read the book, and I will state that most courses in systems engineering, as taught in universities, do not include much of what is in Howard's book. And then we ignore the principle of hierarchies. Take a look at this. How many people are willing to admit they don't understand it or are willing to say it's wrong? It totally ignores Miller rules. There are three levels of the hierarchy in the drawing. And then I start looking at the details. And there's no direct connection between systems engineering knowledge and INCOSI. It's wishful thinking because it puts in COSI in charge of feeding information to graduate programs in systems engineering. And academia is not going to go for that. The body of knowledge does not inform the textbooks and the body of knowledge does not inform academia. I'm not sure what this drawing is actually supposed to represent. Take a look at the structural perspective. It's a static view. It deals with the architecture, components, subsystem boundaries, and systems engineering standards. 
Do you know there are no standards for systems engineering? 499 is develop a systems engineering management plan. By the time they got to 499A, they took out the word systems and it became engineering management. Or 632, it's the process for engineering a system. Or 1220, it's the management of the systems engineering process. And if you look at the standards and you try and take the categories of systems engineering and map them into the standards, you find out that those early states of figuring out what the problem and the solutions are are not in any of the standards. And this is based on table in Eric Honor and Ricardo Valenti's paper at the CSSR in 2006. And look at DOD directive. It required systems engineering. Acquisition programs shall be managed through the application of a systems engineering approach, so on and so on. And it emphasized the use of systems engineering. But DOD 5000 gutted systems engineering because it removed the front end and called it IPPD. And I'm not sure if it led or reacted to the situation where systems engineering was not doing very much in the front end. Now look at the DODAF. The DODAF was a great idea, but the purpose of the DODAF was communications equipment. But suddenly it's applied everywhere to all sorts of equipment. And look at the amount of information in it. That's ridiculous. Not my opinion. 45,000 man hours according to Scott Davis in 2003. Well, do we really need that? For those of you familiar with the DODAF, the operational view one describes the use of the system. Here's my view of the DODAF in use. Dilbert has created the DODAF that his customer has asked for. The customer says, I don't understand any of it. I can't tell if it's right or if it would embarrass me. I can't ask for a second opinion without looking stupid. And I can't distribute it because it might be wrong. So I'll put it on this pile and hope something changes. Secretary asks, should I shred your pile of indecision, make it look like an accident? What a waste. The temporal perspective looks at how the system behaves over time. It leads to patterns of behavior, leads to prevention, availability, maintenance, logistics, reliability, lessons learned, and so on. So here's a light-hearted look at the degree of micromanagement in systems engineering standards based by the number of pages in the document. And I haven't taken it past 2002. I'm afraid to. There were systems engineering successes. Look at the Apollo program in 1970. That engineer working on that box is me when I was handsome. The box is probably inside the thing on the lunar surface right in the front of the picture. That was the ALSEP that the astronaut set up on the moon. Successes in Singapore in the social system, the economic system, and the defense system. And Dr. Go King Sway was the chief systems engineer who put it all together. Systems engineering is poorly practiced, but it need not be. I'm going to brag a little here and say, if you look at that strike fighter overrun, I predicted that at the Inkosi Symposium in 2001. And there's a lesson learned from that, that if you're going to predict the future, predict it in a conference that is small or a publication that's not widely read. Because then when you're wrong, nobody will remember it. And when you're right, you can always bring it out and brag. But then when you do that, you upset other people. And what were the top five systems engineering issues in 2003? Lack of awareness of the importance of value timing, accounting, uh, and organization structure of systems engineering on programs. Has anything changed? Adequate qualified resources are generally not available within government and industry for allocation on major programs. Not sure much has changed there. Insufficient systems engineering tools and environments to effectively execute systems engineering on programs. Okay. Requirements definition, development, and management is not applied consistently and effectively. Not sure anything's changed there either. Poor initial program formulation. Hmm. Okay. Let's just address number three. Ever heard, it's a poor workman who blames his tools? And how did Inkosi address these issues? 
No further comments. Nobody's heard of systems, even very large systems, are not developed by the tools of systems engineering, but only by the engineers using the tools. There's also a saying that a fool with a tool is still a fool, or words to that effect. Or perhaps a fool with a tool is a more effective fool. The focus in the literature is on peep, not on process. And yet, INCOSI has been focused on process for years and years and years. I have a theory as to why that is, but I'm not going to present it today. Failures due to poor practice. Inadequate systems engineering in the early design and definition stages. Well, we talked about that. The standards don't cover that area. Or, there's a different link between escalating costs and the ineffective application of systems engineering. My conclusion is standards might help you produce the wrong system more effectively. If you think about that, we've been teaching systems engineering now for at least 20 years. We're teaching the wrong things. We're not teaching the right things. There are all sorts of gaps. So do you wonder about these failures of systems engineering? And I'll come back to that in a moment. In the continuum perspectives, we see dichotomies in complexity, systems and systems of systems, and then we see differences, life cycle models, roles and activities, the A and the B paradigms, domains of the problem, types of problems, complexity, and types of systems engineers. Some of these things you've probably never even thought about. The systems engineering process, the great mantra of systems engineering, some of them, is follow the process and all will be well. Okay, which process? This one? This one, this one, this one, this one. And then we have the A paradigms. The A paradigms is the old paradigm of systems engineering. It starts with the concept of operations. We understand the situation. We define the problem. We define the solution in the form of a system architecture. Then we produce the requirements, and then the subsystem design and the rest of the process follows. Modern paradigm starts with requirements. And then we build a model or a concept of operations or whatever you want to call it, and then create the architecture, and then go through and do the subsystem design and so on. And I can tell you in a different presentation, I've even written it up, and so is Derek Hitchens, as to how this happened. And then there are three different domains of the problems, and you won't find this in any textbook either. Consider the example of traffic congestion. The problem is to reduce the traffic congestion. The solution is a subway system. But the implementation domain, you need to understand tunnel boring and road traffic management, so you, how you divert traffic while you're creating the stations, and so on and so forth. And if you want a really optimal solution, you need to understand all three different domains. And you will not find this in any of the textbooks. And then there are five types of systems engineer based on observation, and it's also reinforced in the innovation literature. The type 5 is a problem formulator and problem solver. The type 4 has the ability to examine a situation and define the problem, but cannot conceptualize a solution. Type 3 can conceptualize the solution and plan the implementation. Type 2 can follow a process to implement the physical solution system. And Type 1 has to be told how to do something. Think about putting a Type 3 systems engineer into a situation where they have to understand the situation and figure out what the problem is. They can't do it. One of the reasons for failures of systems engineering, the wrong type of systems engineer in the situation. You've heard about situation management, generic thinking. Well, there's situational systems engineering as well. From the generic perspective, what systems engineering similar to? Is there another discipline it's similar to? These are the things that are struck out, are things that I'm not going to talk about in this presentation. Systems engineering is similar to math. Math is a set of mathematical tools for remedying mathematical problems. It's used in all disciplines and it's structured as pure and applied math. So systems engineering as an activity, to me, is a set of problem-solving tools for remedying complex problems. It deals with parts and their interactions as a whole. It's used in all disciplines, and it's structured as pure and applied systems engineering as used in domain systems engineering. 
And there are three types of systems engineering the activity. Pure systems engineering, that's systems thinking and beyond, the cognitive skills, problem formulation, and so on. Applied systems engineering, that's requirements, architecture, VMV, that's what we do as systems engineers, and then we do it in the domain, and it's similar to mathematics. By organizing systems engineering in this way, I can now figure out what I need to teach. From the operational perspective, we deal with what systems engineers do, scenarios or use cases. That's how I develop what I needed to teach. One of the ways to generate the requirements for the course was, what do systems engineers do? What knowledge do they need? Well, they work in processes, they work in teams, they create products with different degrees of complexity. But one of the things systems engineers don't produce are systems. Engineers produce the systems. Systems engineers might specify them and they might get involved in the integration and testing, but they don't actually produce systems. Do you think about it that way? The scenarios that we work in are we use pure systems engineering thinking tools in applied systems engineering, conceptual design, requirements management, architecting, testing, integration, V and V, engineering management, and so on. For those of you who learn through vision I can show it like this. Systems engineers use cognitive skills while performing activities in three domains. The cognitive skills are the pure systems engineering, the activities are the applied systems engineering, and they do it in the domain. And there's the relationship. Now the scientific perspective. That's the outcome of the thinking process. We have an issue, problematic situation, system, whatever it is. We perceive it from the different perspectives, and then we the scientific perspective is the statement of the problem. We need to filter out the pertinent information. It's a hypothesis, formulation, and then we go ahead and test it. You can think of the system design process as testing a hypothesis, where the hypothesis is the set of requirements that we think will resolve the customer's problem. Then we go through and build the system and test it. When the system works and the customer's happy because it's the system the customer needs, our hypothesis was confirmed. A design is a similar guess or a hypothesis, and then in science there's research questions. It's basically the outcome of critical thinking. Critical thinking also has a large number of definitions, but I want to give you one of the basic examples. When I first came to Singapore, I went out into a farm, and I saw this tree. And this tree had pink plastic bags on it. And I thought to myself, wow, a plastic bag tree. I never knew that plastic bags grew on trees. You're smiling, or at least you're laughing, because you have the domain knowledge that plastic bags do not grow on trees. They're oil-based or petroleum product based. But supposing I didn't have that knowledge, I might write a research grant to improve the yield of plastic bags on trees or to change the color. And that's basic science. We don't know something. We need to find out and do the domain knowledge. So whenever you're making an inference or making a design, you need to understand that the conclusions you make, the decisions and inferences you make, are only as good as your domain knowledge. You need to know, at times, what you don't know, so you can get help from the people who do. One of the other tools I came up with back in 2000 was I was looking to develop my course in systems engineering. And so I asked around, what are the requirements for a course in systems engineering? And nobody had any. I thought that was strange because we're systems engineers, we deal with requirements, but in education there are no requirements for what we teach. So I said, okay, let's work it out on what systems engineers do. We could take Jerry Kitchen's five layers, we could take the phase or the state in the life cycle, we could look at what they actually did. So we noticed that systems engineers, for example, who are eliciting and elucidating requirements, are working in area 2B. Systems engineering who are testing and integrating systems are working in 2F. And so they will have a different view of what systems engineering is based on what they do. And so those working in 2B will have a different view of those in not 2B. So what is systems engineering? To be or not to be? That is the question. 
Sorry about that, I couldn't resist. When you think the way I do, you see connections that other people don't. So systems engineering, as practiced and taught, is mostly in layer two. And operations research, or system of systems, is up in layer three. The systems thinking people are up in layer three. They are using systems grouped together to achieve something. So no wonder they say you don't need to understand. But the traditional requirements to integration and testing version of the systems engineering process or the system development process is a white box view of systems engineering where the operations people or the systems thinking people are using it as a black box. This sort of allows me to come back to what I was talking about earlier about the elephant. If you take a look at the different publications and perceptions of systems engineering, you can map them into something like this, where you put in the type of systems engineering. I didn't talk about CAMP because of less time. Pure Applied and Lifecycle all are part. You can take the different publications and you can see what's in them. And you can see they're all different because they're all discussing a part of the elephant except number nine, which covers everything. So what can you do with this understanding? You can define the information you want by positioning your area of activity in the HKM framework. You can identify the camp or perspective that you need to view it from. You can define the mixture of pure applied and domain systems engineering, and then find the book or course that will provide the information. You can ask somebody in NCOSI working group or cafe or fellow student get a coach or a mentor, and so on, who's faced the type of problem before. For example, you want to get a master's degree or take a course on systems engineering. Eileen Arnold and I took a look at what was being taught in master's degrees back in 2013 based on what their websites said they were teaching. I'm not going to go into the numbers here. If you're really interested, you can read the publication. But what I want you to see are the gaps. You can see that there are gaps in Hitchin's layer and the state of the life cycle. So all courses are not equal. And in fact, in two degrees, you could get a degree in systems engineering without taking a single required course in a systems engineering topic. I actually found some requirements. The five top aspects of the engineering design process that best equip secondary students to understand, manage, and solve technological problems multiple solutions to a problem or requirement, oral communications, communications, ability to handle open-ended, ill-defined problems, and systems thinking. Well, when I took a look at what the website said those degrees taught, only one had a slight amount of systems thinking. Number 11 was my degree, and of course it covered these things because I had the focus on systems thinking and beyond in there. So at the end of that presentation, I put up this slide. Academia is not teaching the right things in systems engineering courses, and I put in a couple of references. And then I said, who wants to create or join a new NCOSI working group to address these issues? NCOSI's response to the presentation came in an email from Cecilia Haskins. I was banned from presenting at the IS for the following two years. No further comment. Let's talk about complexity. There's a dichotomy in complexity. There's a need to develop new tools and techniques to solve these problems, and the complex problems are being remedied successfully. So we take a look. Um, there was a doctoral dissertation that said the problems posed by complexity seem to be unmanageable. Or Batyam quoted the chaos study. Actually, I think he misread it because in the chaos study, the cause was not complex. It was poor management and the INCOSI version as of 2013. But all these people here need to get out of their box and look around because all these systems are handling complexity without even thinking about it. Let's have a little lighthearted break. I'll ask you the question, why do men say ladies first? And the answer is risk management. So what's the difference between system engineer, a good systems engineer, and an outstanding systems engineer? 
A systems engineer creates the system the customer asks for. A good systems engineer creates the system the customer wants. And an outstanding systems engineer creates the system the customer needs. Never seen this in a book, have you? Let's think about it. Let me tell you about George. George is a systems engineer. He consciously reads every one of the hundreds of requirements provided by the customer. He's got great difficulty understanding what the customer really wants. He even tries to relate the requirements in a hierarchical structure. It doesn't help much. He tries modeling the requirements using an MBSE tool. He still can't get a complete set of requirements from the customer. And the customer changes the requirements every time George talks with him. Does this sound familiar? George is a good systems engineer. He's following the systems engineering process based on the standards. The customer is unhappy. The project is going nowhere. George cares, but he's got no idea what to do about the situation. He's stressed out. His family life is suffering. He's, ho he's losing his friends. He doesn't have any time to relax or anything because he's trying to be a good systems engineer and understand what the customer wants. And even if he can understand what the customer wants, he may not have defined the system the customer needs, which is one reason the customer keeps changing the requirements. George is working in the B paradigm, but he needs to use the stress-free approach used by outstanding systems engineers. Let me show you the difference. A systems engineer talks to the stakeholders and the customer, who is also the stakeholder, and from that generates the requirements and gives the customer the system that is asked for. The good systems engineer, on the other hand, puts in some feedback, might build a model, and as the system engineer understands more about what the customer is asking for, will go back and explain some of the ramifications and the ideas, and the customer and the stakeholder will say, hey, that's a great idea, let's add to it. And so the requirements keep changing on them. Everybody's unhappy about it. The outstanding systems engineer works differently. See that generic system requirements block in the middle, not taught in the textbooks? The outstanding systems engineer understands the problem and then looks at what's happened before and builds a model which includes not only the requirements the customer is asking for, but also what I call system generic requirements. These come from laws and regulations that affect the system. They might be environmental, they might be legal, whatever. They also come from the generic requirements that are inherited from similar systems, that similar systems need to meet these requirements. The outstanding systems engineer builds this holistic model that is complete or much more complete than the one that the good systems engineer does. So as a result, when that model is turned into requirements, it is pretty much good. And I think this is one of the goals of model-based systems engineering. But what this really is, it's back in the A paradigm. We didn't have the tools that they have today to build models, but we could use PowerPoint, we could use drawings, we could even do a little simulation depending on the system. The outstanding systems engineer is nothing new. Well, what can you do with this understanding? You can follow George's footsteps. You can become an outstanding systems engineer. You can learn how to apply systems thinking and beyond to problems. You can learn how other outstanding systems engineers tackle the type of problem you're facing, network with others pursuing the same goal, Join my Facebook group on tackling complex problems. I'm just starting it. You get some benefits and the drawback. When you really use systems thinking and beyond, you see things differently to other people. You make poor jokes, and you've suffered through a couple of them today. You ask uncomfortable questions. You challenge assumptions. You're also comfortable with knowing that in some instances you don't know. You see solutions where other people see problems. Nobody realizes the achievement you made because there weren't any problems. The squeaky wheel gets the attention. Your project didn't have any problems, obviously. You also see what could have been, so you're dissatisfied with your outcome when everyone else is raving about how good it is, and you're in a different paradigm. So the lessons I've learned, you can't really solve a problem unless you understand the three domains. You need to view a problematic situation from a number of perspectives in a system and systematic manner. You definitely need systems thinking and beyond to create innovative solutions. Communications is the key to success, and it's also the key to achieving recognition, because you need to show people that you have identified problems and you're mitigating them. 
And we call that risk management. And that's not only on the system, but it's also on your career. And I've developed two tools that can help do that. Crip charts, categories requirement in process, and enhanced traffic light charts, and there are YouTube videos on both of them. So you want to be an outstanding systems engineer? Join my Facebook group, read my published papers, download them from Incosi or my website. And I've actually taken most of my papers up till about 2015 and published them as an anthology in a framework for understanding systems engineering. I've taken the perceptions that I've talked about today and a lot more, extracted them from the paper and published them in perceptions of systems engineering. And holistic thinking goes into a lot more detail on systems thinking and beyond. And if you like those books for free, send me an email and I will send you PDF versions and talk to me about your problem. My new career is a coach or a mentor. I've been a successful systems engineer and I've got the papers and plaques to prove it. I've been an academic and I've been recognized in my field. Now I'm a coach and a mentor. This is a situation awareness state diagram which I invented, at least as far as I know. There are six states but you may not progress through them in linear format. The basic state is you don't realize that something needs to be changed either because it's wrong or because it could be improved. And I hope that I have taken you from state one to state two today. And now it's up to you. Are you going to go into state three, four, five, six, and hopefully six B? Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'm perfectly happy to answer them. And I will provide free PDF versions of the books, as I said before. Unfortunately, I cannot give you free books. Uh, I cannot give you free copies of the books published by CRC Press, but I can give you a discount code. Thank you very much. I'm done.